Hello and welcome to episode 199 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Washington, D.C. This is Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox in Los Angeles. How's it going? Good, man. I'm excited to uh, talk about the stuff on today's show. I haven't had a chance to listen to Malcolm Gladwell's episode, but um, I'm excited to hear what you have to say about it. Oh God, this is just garbage. But yeah, <laughs> I know I, it's sad because I I like him as an author, or I I did at one point. But anyways, today on the show we're going to talk about Malcolm Gladwell's podcast. Uh, he had an episode on the LSAT. We have a question. Wait, it says from the website exclamation point. What does that mean? Sarah's excited because it was submitted through the new thinkinglsat dot com. Oh, cool. All right. On skipping around and on principal questions, we have an inquiry on writing an addendum, also from the website. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and uh, we are going to tackle Prep Test 71, Section 2, Question 2, if possible. This is a logical reasoning question, and that's always fun. Upcoming events, July LSAT on the 15th of July, obviously. Then on August 1st, that's the last day to register for the September LSAT. We are encouraging everyone who is considering the July LSAT to also consider just registering for September. Um, If you knock it out of the park in July, great, but you won't know until August 28th. So you should register for the September LSAT before you get your score back. That means before August 1st, Uh, the September LSAT then follows on September 21st. Uh, When you get your score on August 28th, you will have the option of canceling after you see your score. That's the one opportunity you'll have to do that in your life, at least as far as we know. But yeah, it's still too late to register for September. So do that if you're signed up for July. You can always email the show at help at thinking LSAT. Send us your selfies if you're so inclined. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, and thinkinglsat.com. Nathan, I know that sometimes you listen to the show, right? I do. Yeah, sometimes. Okay. Not all the time. Yeah. Not all the time. Oh, this isn't your entire life? No, I get sick of myself sometimes. Yeah, so okay. I stop. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, as do I. Um, what what you listen on your phone or what do you listen to? Do you listen in Spotify or? I still just listen to Apple Podcasts because I am subscribed to it and it just downloads automatically. And so it's just always there waiting for me if I want to get some entertainment. Cool. Okay. Uh, some people have been leaving reviews for us on iTunes. It's very helpful. Thank you so much. All the good and bad reviews are much appreciated. I would say that for Demon Updates today, a uh, couple things that you should know. One, We are adding the ability for you to select which types of questions you want to uh, focus on in logical reasoning. We're going to eventually do that for games and uh, I don't know actually how we're going to do that in games and reading comp, but we have definitely done that for logical reasoning. And um, that should be on the live site by the time you hear this. You just go to your settings page, click on types, and then you can select types that you want to focus on. In general, if you don't know what to do, don't do that. The demon will figure out what kinds of questions you should get, both in terms of difficulty level and in terms of types. But sometimes people just want to focus on one or two question types, and now you have the option of doing that. So that's at lsatdemon.com, our current exciting online project. Do you have anything to add to that, Nathan? Uh, Just, I would say, don't do it unless you, you know, like you're... Maybe your 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 LSAT class talked about sufficient assumption and necessary assumption or something, and you're confused and you feel like you need more work on that. Yeah. Then then do it, but um, you know, then quickly undo it <laughs> because you're gonna want to uh, be drilling mixed types is the way to go basically because question identification is so important. Um, like I hand out my logical reasoning encyclopedia to my class, but I basically tell people, hey, this is for extra drilling like this isn't the you know the bulk of what you do yeah no that's a very excellent point i think people will do like 10 or 15 questions in drilling and then they go to their reports page and like oh apparently i'm not very good at weaking questions and then all of a sudden they're all obsessed about weaking questions and that's not 
what you should be doing. You have way too small of a data set. You probably did one weaking question and you got that one wrong, which is why your statistics are showing that you're not doing so great in that question type. But in general, the assumption is that you should just be drilling all the question types and not focusing. And when you do focus, I think you make a good point about maybe doing necessary and sufficient assumption questions at the same time because you've narrowed your focus, so it's going to be a little bit easier and you can target something that you want to get better at. At the same time, by not doing only necessary assumption questions or only sufficient assumption questions, you still have the opportunity to decide, oh, wait, do I think this is a necessary assumption question or do I think this is a sufficient assumption question? as opposed to just knowing because you've only selected one question type. So if you do decide to focus in on certain question types in the daemon, we'd say pick two or three so that you're focusing, but not knowing that they're all exactly the same. Yeah, when you do 30 necessary assumption questions in a row, you stop reading the question. I mean, you're just like, yep, I know it's a necessary assumption question. So you skip right over that part. Yeah. And question identification is just so important. One thing I do in class a lot is somebody will say, hey, can can we review number 14? And I'll look at whoever asked the question and I'll go, okay, cool. And I read the argument to them and then I'll say, uh, hey, Mary, what what type of question is that? Yeah. And then they stumble. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's like, well, um, question types aren't everything, but they aren't nothing either. And, you know, you, you're going to have a different, you should have a different thought process um, as you try to answer each of the different question types. And so if you can't identify that type, then you're in trouble. Um, it's just, there's, you know, there's easier ways. <laughs> and so it, it is really important that you know how to, how to spot them. But um, I mean, you can actually use this new functionality of the demon that way, right? You can, um, if you even do restrict it all the way to just only necessary assumption questions, as you do your drilling, you can look very carefully at all the different ways that they can ask you the necessary assumption question. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. So use it cautiously, use it to your advantage. Don't make a beginner mistake and just assume that (laughs) you should target one after doing 10 questions in life or reasoning. <laughs> yeah. Or just the, the beginner mistake of focusing too much on one part of the test. Mm-hmm. Do, you ever, do you ever get somebody who is like, well, I've decided that first, before I do anything else, I'm just going to really study whatever, game, yeah. games or reading yeah. comp or whatever. Yeah. It's like, I'm only going to, for two months, I'm going to only do this. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yeah, Totally. No, that that's a very common thing. It's like someone has nine weeks and they're like, well, for the next three weeks, I'm going to focus on games. Then I'm going to focus on logical reasoning. Then I'm going to focus on reading comp. That'd be like working out and focusing on push-ups for three weeks and then turning your focus yeah. to pull-ups. And it's like, <laughs> by the time you're done with the pull-ups, yeah, you're out of shape with the push-ups because you haven't done it for three weeks. Yeah, totally. So, okay, cool. This, Yeah, this is good stuff. We're going to continue to iterate on that and try to make it the best tool available for anyone to get ready for the test and it keeps learning about everyone by the way all the time so this is i hope you don't mind but the ai is getting smarter (laughs) eventually you actually will be able to praise the demon the when it becomes your your overlord yeah (laughs) (laughs) so speaking of this is a little random but um i i (laughs) I have this uh, scale that's like super smart and I actually Uh don't really care about my weight. If if you asked me what my weight was, I wouldn't have known like three, two weeks ago before I got this scale, but I needed to get the scale because I needed to know the weight of my second oldest son for some like medical application for scouting. Right. So I was like, okay, well I'll buy a scale. And then I go online. I'm like, dang, these like scales these days are cool. You get on and they tell you all sorts of different things. Right. And, um, so different users are in my app for this scale. It'll tell me like my muscle mass and all this stuff. Anyway, so I got on the scale and it's like, your weight has changed dramatically. Are you the same person? And I was like, whoa, uh, no. Yeah, oops, I was in the wrong uh, user profile, right? So anyways, that's where, that's where the demon is going. It's going to get to a point where it's like, 
it knows you so well that if someone else breaks into your account and starts doing questions, they're going to be like, are you the same person? <laughs> <laughs> we know what you should be doing. <laughs> Anyways. Cool. Anything else to announce before we dive into this podcast, I guess? No, let's do it. All right. So tell me what what happened. I've seen several emails about that this week, but I haven't had a chance to totally dive in. Yeah. So Malcolm Gladwell is a New Yorker uh, writer Mm -hmm. and author of several books, um, The Tipping Point and Blink and I don't know, a bunch of other stuff, which... I like his books and I, I like his columns and I've enjoyed some of the episodes of his podcast, which is called revisionist history. Okay. And I remember in journalism school, I remember people talking about him as, well, he's not really a journalist. He's, he's more like a provocateur. Mm. And, uh, I, I never really understood what people were talking about until he did a, an entire podcast about my area of expertise, which is the LSAT. Yeah. So season four, episode one of revisionist history is an episode called puzzle rush, Hmm. which already kind of betrays the fact that he doesn't understand what he's talking about. Yeah. (laughs) You have to listen to it, Ben, because it, it will it will make you angry. You'll laugh, but it'll make you angry <laughs> in a in a funny way. You've been on the email chain where our whole team is popping off about this. Um, literally everyone who I have had listened to it um, hated it. <laughs> All the people that I know that know the LSAT, yeah, hated it. So what he did was he registered for the actual LSAT. He went with his assistant Camille. And the two of them together went and took the LSAT okay. at, uh, in New York City mm-hmm. at Pace. Okay. And on the way to creating this episode, he... <laughs> First of all, he, he makes a huge deal about how he's Canadian and therefore at a major disadvantage because they don't have standardized tests, apparently. What? <laughs> he's acting like he's from, you know, a, a non-English speaking country. During the entire episode, he's like, I just don't know. I just can't. I just, oh my God. You know, he's just like freaking out about like this whole concept of a timed standardized test. He just can't get, get wrap his mind around it. He just doesn't understand. <laughs> Welcome okay. to the States. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, all right, dude, like, f- fine, you're Canadian. We get it. But, you know, Americans are used to this. And he's just, I, you know, he's, I guess he's trying to be dramatic and thought provoking. But the truth is, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. And he just, like, he has this pseudo scientific thing. Like he even says in the beginning of the podcast, he's like lined up for the LSAT with Camille and everyone else there in line is, is there because they want to be a lawyer. And he says, well, I'm there in the interest of science. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it, and then he proceeds to just do the most shallow, unscientific, just like he made up his mind in advance. First of all, he is has this whole big thing about he's competing with Camille, his assistant, and he can't he 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 hasn't so he didn't announce what they actually scored yet. He I guess he's going to wait till the next episode to announce what he actually scored. But it sure sounds like he's going to get his ass kicked by Camille and he <laughs> He he, kind of like in a it's it struck me as kind of misogynist the way he was talking about it. Like he he's making a million excuses for the fact in advance that Camille's going to kick his ass on this test. Mm. God, there's so much. He goes out and gets advice, okay, to try to get some help. He says because you have to get some help on the LSAT, you have to get some help. Okay, which you know it's not wrong, but. Also, he would have done much better if he wouldn't have gotten the help he got. 
Mm-hmm. He went and talked to these Princeton Review guys who now apparently are doing some project called Noodle. I don't know. I'd never heard of it before. Mm. They have no fucking clue what they're talking about when it comes to the LSAT. <laughs> and so they're giving him advice on the reading comp. Okay. And the advice is basically don't understand. Process the passage, but don't actually understand the argument. Wait, what is process? I don't mean? fucking know. It makes no sense. Like the advice just makes no sense. One of the dudes told him to read the passage in one minute. Oh, okay. You're struggling for time. Read faster. <laughs> right. That's exa- No, that's exactly the advice that they give him is that you have to rush. Oh. They tell him at one point that you're supposed to be a little bit breathless. You should be a little breathless. Wait, get out of town. I I'm tell people fucking... to take a deep breath. Everything we say is exactly the opposite. This is like, where's Waldo? Black and white. I can't understand. This is totally different. This is, it's, it's bizarro world LSAT advice is what it is. Did, did these guys specialize in the LSAT at Princeton uh, they, Review or are they no, just random? Well, I don't fucking know. Like maybe they are tel- test prep experts but they're not LSAT experts yeah maybe they're not experts at all maybe they're just pure charlatans but they said they were (laughs) from Princeton Review I don't understand they were from the famous Princeton Review he he says (laughs) and (laughs) famously horrible at the LSAT Princeton Review I can tell you a lot of famous people who suck (laughs) (laughs) um you know, they spend a lot of time in the podcast. They have him go through all the questions and pick the two worst answers. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the dude says, they're not wrong. They're just worse. Okay. <laughs> so before answering any of the questions on reading comp, he goes through all the questions and eliminates the two worst answers. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Wait, you're saying that he goes through all the questions once, narrows it down to three, yeah. and then proceeds to go through them again? I don't fucking know. I don't I, I have no idea what they're do like what the purpose of this exercise is. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> It's criminally bad advice. I was talking to a friend last night and she said she was going to tell all her competitors to listen to this podcast, all the, all her LSAT competitors, all other law school applicant competitors. <laughs> she was going to tell them to listen to this so that they would get fucked up by this horrible, horrible advice. I mean, if you, if you walk away from that being like, oh, so I have to rush, then I'm not supposed to understand then the the wrong answers aren't wrong. They're just not as good. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just fundamentally 100% wrong. Yeah. And I'm supposed to, I'm not supposed to really get them right. I'm just supposed to eliminate the two worst. Well, if you are able to eliminate the two worst, you have raised your expectation from a one out of five, which is 20%, to a one out of three, which is 33%. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What? Yeah. So wait, so you've made it to the one thirties. That's yeah. If, if, if you can't eliminate the two worst answers, you're in the one twenties trying to get into the one thirties. Well, you know, I don't know what market are they targeting? Who knows? It, it it's it, it gets worse. I mean, it's like they're telling him to only get like oh, if as long as you get the topic sentence of each paragraph. Oh my goodness. Ugh. Ben, is, is there a topic sentence of each paragraph? <laughs> One would hope, but hopes are re- rarely realized on the LSAT. There's not, this is not a fucking seventh grade five paragraph essay <laughs> where the first sentence of each paragraph is the fucking topic sentence. And the, and the last sentence is, uh, wraps it up for the paragraph. <laughs> he, 
he, some quotes, he says at one point, the LSAT doesn't require me to be me. It requires me to be someone else. Huh? Like he, well, he just, I mean, I don't know if he went into it with this expectation or if they, these idiots from the Princeton review, like convinced him that, that he was supposed to do it this way, but he just got it into his head that it's not about understanding and you're not supposed to understand it because you, because of the time. So he made the classic blunder. Like he did, he did it exactly precisely wrong. Wow. He was only thinking about speed. He was not thinking about understanding. Yeah. And he keeps popping off about how like he doesn't say it, but he means it that like he thinks he's super smart, but he also is struggling brutally on the LSAT exactly because he is rushing so much. Yeah. You know what's interesting about this this quote that you just said? You said, the LSAT doesn't require me to be me. It requires me to be someone else. I think beginners often feel this way. I mean, this may be in reference to the rushing, but um, I think a lot of times people feel like the logic on the LSAT is counterintuitive in some cases, or they're like, I would never think that. Or you're telling me that um, the fact that some people eat apples does not mean that some people don't eat apples. It's like, yeah, well, it could mean that, but it doesn't have to mean that. And and then they feel like they have to go into this different world or different place when they're on the LSAT. And what I like to explain to people often is that, no, you are making changes. Like you're using words differently than you did before. But that's not because there's the world and then there's the LSAT. That's because the way you've used things in the past is incorrect. <laughs> you don't, Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude and it's gotten you through life totally fine because most people aren't engaging in conversation that has contra- contractual you know, consequences for yeah. what you say to your friend. They're not gonna hold you to it in most cases. And they themselves may not necessarily know precisely what was said, but the way you use the language is not as precise as it could be. And I always point people to the dictionary. I'm like, you don't know the word usually means most of the time? That's fine, but check it out. That's what it actually means. So it doesn't mean what you feel like it means. It means what it means. And the LSAT is using that definition. Yeah. I mean, most people don't use it that way. Okay. Most people aren't lawyers either. Yeah. And actually, you know? I'm not even, I'm not even sure that you can, I mean, what happens is people like the individual test taker doesn't use it that way. So then they assume that most people don't use it that way. But when you actually look at usage surveys and things like that, most people are using it correctly. It's just that there's a sizable minority that's not using it correctly. And you're a part of that minority, at least for that word. And maybe for other words, you're in the majority and you use it correctly. But the LSAT comes in as a harsh school teacher and says, look, that's not what that means. And we're going to test you on that over and over and over again until we figure out whether you can catch that or not. Anyways, sorry, random. I agree. (laughs) Digression there. But I think that may be part of what sometimes people feel at first, like, oh, I have to change the way I do things and I talk. And it's like, yeah, you're changing it for the better. You're becoming a much more precise speaker of the English language. And this is English um, karate, basically. Yeah, I always say that lawyers are gladiators of the English language. Like, you're you're going to be doing battle <laughs> using words. Yeah. So you need to learn how to use them precisely. And that's what the LSAT requires you to do. And it, this, you know, he keeps saying there's no meander time on the LSAT. You're just supposed to get the bones of it. If you don't get a chunk of the argument, then just keep going. You don't need to understand it. Hmm. It's sad, too, because, like, he's a he's an excellent writer. So he is a gladiator of the English language. And if he just slowed down and paid attention to what was being said, I'm sure he'd do quite well on this test. If he was a better fucking journalist, he would have asked like someone, he would have gotten actual decent advice instead of getting the worst possible advice. Yeah. How did he find these people? <laughs> That's too bad. I don't, it's like a mistake there. I don't know what happened. He didn't survey it, enough people or something. 
It's ridiculous. It's just, I think, you know, maybe he went for like the name recognition or whatever. The famous. <laughs> the famous Princeton Review. It's like, yeah, those guys, like they don't even offer LSAT classes anymore. Or do they? Does the Princeton Review even have classes anymore? I don't know. I don't. I think they don't for a reason, which is that they're garbage. Like they don't understand the test. <laughs> Telling people not to understand. Oh, we don't understand it either. Yeah. You don't have to understand it. It's not supposed to. You're not supposed to understand it. It's fucking bullshit. He says, I don't get any points for understanding. I get points for bubbling in the right answer. Okay. It's like, how do you think you find the right answer, dude? <laughs> <laughs> it's not by eliminating the two worst. <laughs> It's by eliminating the four wrong answers and picking the one right answer. He he walks out of the test, Ben, and he says that he thinks he got zero correct on the lot of things. <laughs> might have helped to do just one game and figure it out. Yeah, it might have helped to like do some kind of prep instead of, you know, the whole thing that they, I mean, and it could just be a matter of editing, right? So maybe it's their editors that need to be shamed, but the whole thing of where he was getting LSAT advice, they were giving him advice about reading comp and logical reasoning. I don't think, you know, they didn't talk about logic games at all other than he just goes in there and gets zero points on the games. If he had just done one game, one game, not even a, a section, just one game on his own with someone who knows how to do games, <laughs> he would have gotten points for sure. He would have gotten like eight or nine or 10 points. Yeah. Right. All you have to do is get the first perfect game and then randomly guess on everything else. And you're already going to be s at least like seven, eight points. Yeah. And that first game is almost always going to be a simple ordering game. Or and not only that, but like you don't need to know how to fucking figure you don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but like the words have meaning. You can read the you can read it and figure it out. Yeah. It may take you 35 minutes because you're testing each answer choice, but you can figure it out. For the games. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Like he, he's, I mean, I've read his books. He's plenty bright enough. He knows what words mean. The words have meaning. He can read those words and he can figure that shit out. Yeah. And instead he just like goes in there and has a fucking meltdown and, and, you know, is, and he's doing this so that he can pop off about like the fact that we do timed tests. There's a quote that says, because all you Americans apparently accept as gospel this idea that the smart person is not the person who gets the right answer. The smart person is the person who gets the right answer the quickest. Uh, and by the way, so that's not gospel. That's actually been studied <laughs> quite a bit for a long time. Competence is a function of both what you can do and how long it takes you. Yeah, no shit. Like, of course, it's, it, he has this ultra naive, like, why would speed possibly matter? And it's like, dude, do you think that lawyers don't have to think on their feet? Like, of course, yes, they do work long 12 hour days and stuff, but they also do a lot of work. And they also, in certain circumstances, have to do shit real quickly. Like if you're in a courtroom setting or in a deposition or whatever, and you have to like, you know, come up with the right question at the right time. <laughs> Just, I, I just, it's, it's this whole advice that he got to go fast was like some alien landing on this planet and saying, Hey guys, how do you put out fires? And we're like, well, you take the gasoline and you pour it on the fire. Yeah, completely. <laughs> They're like, it didn't work. <sighs> he, he, he comes off um, with his whole th relationship to Camille. He's, He's complaining the whole time about how Camille, he's like, he's like asking for like how much, you know, what's the, what's the odds that I'm going to beat Camille? And he's talking to Camille about how he's not, Amer he's, he says, um, at one point he says, she's young, she's American as if like, those are, <laughs> you know, those are advantages. <laughs> he, he says at one point, all you, you young Americans should be doing well. Yeah. He says at one point, you rig a test so Camille wins. Like he's just, he's, he's complaining about the fact that she's fucking smarter than he is. Um, meanwhile, she packed his snack and sharpened his pencils. <laughs> Literally, that's in the podcast. She packed his fucking snack and sharpened his pencils for him. <laughs> and he complains about the snack that she packed him. Oh my gosh. 
Uh. He goes, he's, he's, uh, he's talking about how she's young, you know, and she, and, um, and he's, he's so old that he can't do well on the test. And she goes, Camille goes, doing well on the LSAT isn't about age, but reading ability. (laughs) (laughs) The one like smart person in the room. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Totally. Man, I wish we could get Camille on the show. That would be be awesome. Yeah, we should. That would be fantastic. Anyone know Camille? Um, Please reach out to her for us. You know, he goes into this thing where he go. he says, um, we should get off of this, but he, he, he goes, um, and he's doing it like, I, th- I, I mean, I recognized that he was doing it tongue in cheek, but I feel like no one else would realize that he was being tongue in cheek. Be- he goes, um, if you're a super go getter, then you can't score below 175 because then you can't get into Harvard. If you can't get into Harvard, you're never going to get an offer from a big law or get a Supreme court clerk clerkship. Your life is over. It hinges on those five sections. When we decide who's smart enough to be a lawyer, we use a stopwatch. And he's, you know, so he, he, he actually threw out the number 175 without like explaining that this is hyperbole. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Wow. On the next episode of Revisionist History, he's going to, Still keep talking about the LSAT, apparently. And he's actually going to go visit LSAC. <sighs> so he's going to continue his, you know, is that something, shoddy treatment. <laughs> is that something where you can just go show up and knock on their doors in Newton, Pennsylvania? Or is, as he scheduled? Nah, I mean, he's interview? Malcolm Gladwell. I'm sure he, 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 they probably are fawning over him. Right, he's like a he's famous. He's a fucking superstar. He's from the New Yorker. He's like, so he's gonna just waltz in there and you know, do his like witty little observations that are complete bullshit. And who knows? Can't wait. <laughs> so he's gonna interview President Testy. Is that the idea? I That's would imagine her name. By the way, just I'm not making that up. Kelly Testy. Yes, I I imagine that he is. I I would be. I would be surprised if she does not uh, honor him with a presidential visit or whatever. Wow. Well, I hope he tells her all the great things that he's learned about how to do well in the test. (laughs) (laughs) See what she says. She's like, yes, it is a matter of timing. There's, there's so much more. There's just like, it's, it's just, Oh God. <sighs> okay. Cool. So we haven't, <laughs> thank you. So I'm sure people will check that out. That's season four, episode one of revisionist, of revisionist history. history. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I used to, I used to be like into it because it's like, Oh, I get to learn about all these new things that I don't know anything about. But I'm realizing now that like, if you didn't know anything about the LSAT, you oh, would know wow. far less now if you had listened to that. Yeah, you you would have learned exactly the wrong thing. So um, you're gonna yeah, I don't I, think I'm gonna be wasting my time with that podcast very much anymore. Yeah, oh, I could totally see it now. Someone's someone's at a bar and someone says, "Oh, I'm taking the LSAT." And they, oh, let me tell you, this is what you got to do. You eliminate the worst two answers. <laughs> it's like, nope. All right. So this next email is from Jake. It says, "Hi, Ben and Nathan." In the most recent episode, you reiterated your advice that students shouldn't care about the time while they're working through a section. But I recall quite a few instances in Nathan's LR Encyclopedia where he encourages us to skip certain logical reasoning problems because they look like they'd take too long. Several times he says something to the effect of, why do one really long, intimidating problem when you can do two in the same time? I can find a page... I can find page sites if needed. Oh, no, we don't need that. But I think they happened often enough that he would know what I'm referring to. Doesn't the advice to skip certain LR problems because they look too long, difficult, conflict with the advice, the advice not to think about the time? After all, skipping because something looks like it will take long only makes sense if you're thinking about time in the first place. Any thoughts on this? Nathan? Sure. Um, so part of it is that my, my thinking about the LSAT has changed over the years. 
it, it's kind of like question selection is sort of LSAT dogma. And I remember in the first couple years of my career, I remember being like, oh yeah, that's a real, look how long this question is. Look how short this question is. I, I think when I give that advice, what I normally mean is if it's after the five minute warning, yeah, you might choose to do the shorter one instead of the longer one. I also just don't give that advice anymore. Um, we're going through an edit right now of the logical reasoning encyclopedia, by the way, to remove those references to just say like, Hey, you know, these questions are not impossible. I will say that for beginners, for, for like real new LSAT students who are really struggling with the test. Um, I think parallel reasoning questions tend to be really difficult. You have that experience, Ben, with like novices. Yeah. I think in some ways they are because they test a variety of different skills that other question types uh, test only one skill. So they test structure, they test your understanding of logic and the relationship between premises and conclusions and they test your ability to understand flaws and it's all in one package. And then you got to do that again (laughs) in each answer choice. You got to say, wait, is this doing the same thing or not? Uh, So yeah, they, they can be challenging for those at the beginning. It's also great practice because if you can figure those out, then the other questions are going to usually be easier. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm glad Jake pointed this out. Uh, it's, um, I think partially it's just advice that I don't give anymore. I also, if I do give this advice, it's very qualified. It's, it's just like if you are you know, a rank beginner and if you are really struggling or if the five minute warning has already been called and you have a choice between doing a long ass number 23 or, you know, shorter 24, 25, it might be worth it to skip the real long one. Mm -hmm. That said, boy, when the answer turns out to be a, sometimes on those parallel reasoning questions, you know, if you can, if you can like spot it, yeah, that question ends up being a lot faster too. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I do not uh, really give that advice very much. Cool. Jake continues, I also wanted to ask about another potential conflict, principal questions. Uh, Here we go again. Nathan's LR Encyclopedia classifies certain problems as identify a guiding principal question and applying a principle that is given question. I have heard you guys say that principal questions don't really exist. Not sure how to square what I read in the book with this advice, though. Jake. Um, Jake has an old version of the book. That's uh, about, let me think, it's been probably two years now um, ago. I went through the book and I reclassified all of the principal questions. When I first wrote the book, I had used LSAC's own nomenclature for question types <laughs> and LSAC talks about identifying a guiding principle and applying a principle that is given. Yeah. And then after teaching the LSAT long enough, I realized that that's just not helpful at all. Um, that you can just classify those as either must be trues or as strengthen questions. And so we went through and we, um, moved all of those questions into the appropriate, uh, chapter. So I don't know if Jake, got a used version of the book or I just happen to have an old one lying around or something, but, um, that's, what's up there, Jake. There's no such thing as a principal question and new versions of my logical reasoning encyclopedia don't talk about principal questions and the demon doesn't talk about principal questions. No, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you got those names you said from LSAC and so I'm assuming you got them from super prep, right? Yes. Yeah. I remember reading that book when I first started as well. And, universally ever since uh, I began and any opportunity I've had to give that book to anyone, uh, people complain about the explanations at the end of that book. And it's always been befuddling to me because the test writers are so good at writing the test. How is it that they're not good at explaining their rationale? They clearly have one. Uh, It's it's yeah, befuddling, uh, and it's weird because I, I think that the same people who wrote the explanations in Super Prep um, must be the group that's writing explanations for Khan Academy's class. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's people who don't understand the test as well as we do, <laughs> that's for sure. I wonder if it's not the test writers. Like That's my, it has to be not the people who are actually writing the test. It has to be like 
someone in the LSAC fortress, you know, just who thinks the world of themselves. Oh, I'll explain it to the people. Yeah. I mean, people <laughs> like, universally complain okay. about those explanations. The games are the worst explanations. <laughs> yeah. They're like, well, do whatever drawing you want, which has a right element of truth. But then their drawings are so convoluted and I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> um, I, it's worse than, you know, other <laughs> diagramming techniques that I've seen out there. But Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Uh, oh, I was going to say one other thing. You know, you've you've talked about the revisions that you've made to your book, and just the other day, someone emailed me from a class. They, they had taken the class, my class, about two, three years ago, I, 2016, uh-huh. actually. And they said, hey, I remember that you had these quizzes that you gave in class. Can you find the quizzes for my class and send them to me? And... <laughs> I was at first I was like, oh yeah, sure, this shouldn't be too hard. So I looked for the class and I I started scanning through and I'm like, holy cow, like there are probably realistically something like 35 versions of the class study guide. It's evolved over time. And I had a hard time pinning down which study guide she had been using for that class. I I didn't want to throw her off with different page numbers and all that stuff, but yeah, I mean, we just keep learning how the test really is operating on a core level, right? And how to explain that. That's the advantage of being small, right? I mean, we're 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 more nimble. I've always, I've never like taught the same class twice. Yeah, it it always has just changed every every time. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's good because it has kept me from just being dogmatic, you know. And um, even when I go back and watch my old videos, that's that's what's awesome about the demon. I love that uh, for games in particular. I love that um, you know there's going to be like ten different videos in there for the yeah. same logic game <laughs> because you can see you know you doing it a bunch of different ways and me doing it different ways. And when we record new videos today, um, my methods now are definitely different from what they used to be. Oh, I do sure. worlds now so much more, yep. and I I do so much less of the like writing down each rule in a super technical like mechanical fashion mm-hmm. and instead i just like hey i'm gonna just go straight to a solution here you know <laughs> like well there's only these two ways to do it let's just work out those two ways and figure out what happens and it's just like just so much easier i think to do it that way but anyway you can watch uh, all those videos on the demon yeah well it's funny you say that because people will say in class be like would you would you do worlds every time for this game? And I, and all these past videos compel me to be 100% honest. It's like, um, well, now I would. I would do it now. This is how I would do this game going forward. I might try different ways or different worlds, but boy, this works really well. But that's not what I did when I took the test, and that's not what I did three years ago. Look at that video right there. I'm like doing the whole... Let's do each of the if questions first. And then there was a time, if you go back even further, where I didn't even do the if questions first, right? There's been a whole evolution, but we just keep trying new things and seeing what works the best. Yeah, and learning from students over time. Yeah. I mean, I hear I, someone, I my student, um, Ala, in my uh, San Francisco class, emailed me and said that she she learned that she should consider the reading comprehension passage to be a collection of all the right answers. Hmm. And I was like, oh shit. That's interesting. Can I steal that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've stolen everything without asking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to steal you. it regardless of whether she <laughs> agreed or not. But uh, I, 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 uh, she said yes and she was flattered. And I, um, I'm like, I love to give her credit for it because it's like, it's the best thing about reading comprehension I've ever heard. It's like the first thing I say now about reading comprehension. Yeah is that that passage is a collection of all the right answers. Mm. And Malcolm Gladwell maybe would have done better if he would have taken that advice <laughs> instead of like get the topic sentence of each paragraph and, and rush through it in one minute. <laughs> it's like, no, dude, that's all the right answers. Read that, understand it, and then the questions will be easy. He just had to listen to Camille. <sighs> that's all he had to do. Yeah, Camille's like, well, it's about how good of a reader you are, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, moving on. Yeah, you want to take this one? Yep. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I made a mistake and I need advice. 
I have a 128 on my official LSAT record because I got violently ill during the test and completely forgot to cancel my score in the days following. I'm applying for law school this fall. Should I write an addendum explaining the low score or not write one at all, considering I am retaking and have a higher score on record anyway? I know you've mentioned on the podcast that admissions officers don't want or care to hear excuses, but this is really the only way I could explain that score. Ha ha. <laughs> I love the podcast. Hope to hear back on this with tempered advice. Thanks. Tempered advice. B. I know that jumped out at me too. I was, I wasn't sure what B was trying to say there. Hmm. I guess we need to tone it down. B wants us to be nice. B did say that he or she loves the podcast in an effort to <laughs> win us over. <laughs> All right, B. Well, I I don't have a problem. So I, I have mixed feelings here. I don't, I don't have a problem with a short addendum that's one or two sentences that says, I got very sick and was unable to cancel my score. My concern, and this is why I'm hesitating, is that if you just leave it at that, I was unable to cancel my score, that's fine. But you would not want to say that I was sick, so I forgot. I don't know. It's just, it seems like it's a mixed bag. Like you're now, you're explaining why you have this poor score on record. Okay, good. But then you're like raising other questions. Like, why'd you forget? Lawyers don't forget deadlines for court cases, even if they're sick. So, I don't know. Some schools do ask specifically, and so you would need to address it, and that's what I would say. I would say I got sick. I wouldn't say violently ill. That's overselling. No. Say what you got. Oversharing. Yeah. Or, yeah, I guess you have to be careful about what you say. You don't want to overshare. But at the same time, details and facts make it more believable. Like, there is an element here where I'm like, really? You got sick, and that's why you got a 128? So, if you say I got the flu, say I got the flu – and was unable to cancel my score. I mean, even then, it's kind of like, why weren't you able to? Um, yeah, if you were in the hospital or if you were in a coma, yeah, <laughs> like then coma. I then I get that you can't cancel your score. But like you're this, in a coma. it does look that's why you got a one twenty eight. Well, the second you start explaining the whole thing of like why you didn't cancel, I think you just shouldn't probably say that. Yeah. Don't even mention it. Just, it. Yeah. No, it just like, let them ask that question. Let them go. Why didn't you cancel? Because if you start, I mean, you just, I forgot, I completely forgot to cancel. It's like, well, that's not a point in your favor at all. Yeah. Like that's another strike against It's like the one twenty eight is a strike. Also, you forgot to cancel. That's an additional strike. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't say I forgot to cancel, at least you only get the one strike. Yeah. And if you just say I was I, I yeah, I had the flu. Um, you know, my retake is is a better reflection. Whatever. I don't know. Just keep it short <laughs> and don't don't be making too many excuses. Yeah, and that's only if you need to. Some schools don't require it, so don't. I, well, I mean, you need to let your other credentials speak for themselves, right? Like you, the best, the best way to overcome this is to get your one sixty something or one seventy something. Yeah, then they're just like, and, I don't know what happened, but clearly something went wrong. Maybe, yeah, maybe they'll think you miss bubbled. That's one thing about it. if you don't have to right. tell them, just don't tell them. They'll they'll take their guesses, especially the farther away you get. Yeah, when if you're a really good candidate they're not going to care about the 128 because they're only caring about your highest score anyway. Now, if your best LSAT is 145, <laughs> you know, yeah, then that's not like you're not looking awesome with that. Yeah. And that's not because you're 128. That's because you're 145 is just right. not, not where <laughs> right. it should be. So, <laughs> Right. <laughs> We get a lot of that, don't we, Ben? I mean, I get I get emails all the time where people are like, well, my undergraduate GPA is only 2.5, but I have all kinds of good reasons for that. And it's just like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's get to the part where we talk about what your LSAT score is. Yeah, well. Because if you've got a 170, 
then I'm willing to listen to your reasons for having a 2.5. And even then, but when you've got a 150, mm-hmm. it's like, mm. <laughs> it kind of makes sense. <laughs> and even then, what? Oh, sorry, I was going to say, even then, when people start giving their excuses, like what's happening here is the excuses start making things worse. It's yep. so like you have a 2.5. Okay, there are plenty of good reasons and there are plenty of bad reasons. Maybe a good reason is that you had a full-time job because your your parents were ill and needed help at home or something and maybe you should have decided to get out of law sc- or get out of school but you couldn't for one semester, who knows. Like there might be some legit reasons, but as soon as you start unpacking those You raise questions. People start interjecting. Maybe they shouldn't because they don't know what it's like to live your life until they live your life, but they're going to start judging. They're going to start saying, well, hmm, okay, I'm sorry that that tragic thing happened to you. Why did you keep going to school? Or why did you you take 21 credits? Wait, what? Yeah. Like, and so you end up just kind of (laughs) digging your own grave yeah. And it's best just to keep this short. If you have to write something, keep it factual. And I mean, really, those two things. By keeping it short, you're forcing yourself to not talk about things that are just going to make them worse. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it it is it is a system driven by your credentials. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to get around that with excuses. Like your GPA is what your GPA is and your LSAT is what your LSAT is. Yeah. And if you come in with all sorts of excuses about why your GPA and your LSAT suck, um, just doesn't change the fact that your LSAT and your GPA suck, and they're probably not going to be very interested. Yeah. And you know, and that's like, boy, it goes back to the our thing about you remember the uh, under three point oh don't go to law school thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. It is like, yeah, you're kind of fighting an uphill battle here. Like, are you sure this is what you want to get yourself into? Yeah. I don't want, I don't mean to crush your dreams or anything but like is this really the happiest road for you to go down cuz you know like there can always be exceptions but exceptions are the exception mm-hmm. right I mean generally speaking people with better undergraduate GPAs do much better in law school yeah and people with better LSAT scores do much better in law school mm-hmm. so you could be the exception sure but on average, you're not going to be the exception. Yeah. Most people are not the exception. So <clears throat> anyway. Your comments there, by the way, remind me of a couple of the like one-star reviews <laughs> that we've gotten on iTunes. They're like, yeah. the show is demotivating because they don't tell you to like that you can do it. And <laughs> I like, what, like, you want us to just say like, you know what? It's all right. You're scoring in the 140s, like, and that's the best. You've been studying for a long time, and that seems to be the best you can do. But there are a lot of great lawyers out there who have fulfilling careers who are happy and they never broke 144. It's like, no, there are not that many. Like Nathan just said, there are exceptions. But chances are that you're going to be happier doing something else. So, I wouldn't look at it as crushing your dreams. I would look at it as finding new opportunities. Like realizing that you suck at something is an awesome thing. It's like, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I should figure out what I am good at and go after that and be fulfilled because I'm doing something that's challenging to me, but not so challenging that I end up in loads of debt, out of school, wondering what what's next. Anyway. I talk about the power of quitting all the time. I mean, I'm as happy in my career as I think it's possible to be. Like, I really don't know anybody who likes their job more than I like my job. Yeah. But the reason I got here is because right out of college, I was a stockbroker. I hated it. I sucked at it. I quit. Then I was a project manager. Uh, for a web development company in San Francisco. I hated it. I sucked at it. I quit. Then I was like an editor, like a content manager for like a news website kind of a thing. I did that for a couple of years, went to journalism school, 
kind of wanted to be like a writer for a while. Didn't, didn't, didn't work for me. Didn't it like, didn't fit. So I quit. <laughs> I went to business school, got an MBA. I came out of business school and got an MBA job. I was a product manager. I've been a project manager and a product manager, Ben, and I can't really explain the difference between the two. <laughs> um, I was terrible at that job. I hated it. I sucked at it. I quit. And I was like 30 years old and I had no idea what to do with my life. And I was just sort of casting about looking for, you know, something to figure how, fuck, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And, um, I saw an ad for GMAT teaching like at night and I, I started a part-time job as a GMAT teacher and I really loved it. I loved the teaching aspect. I didn't love the GMAT students because they're not as smart as LSAT students and I don't like the test as much. But then I started teaching LSAT. And I fell in love with it (laughs) and I would not have had the opportunity. Oh, oh, by the way, then I went to law school and I hated that and sucked at that too. And it's like, so I'm not, I mean, getting your dreams crushed is a good thing. If the dream is not the appropriate dream for you. Yeah. Like moving on to the next thing is good. That's like the whole point is to just try things and see if it's a good avenue for you. Yeah. And if it's not, I mean, you know, if you're sitting there with a 2.5 and the best LSAT score you can get is a 145, um, the odds are significantly stacked against you for being a lawyer. Yeah, It's just probably not the right thing. Now, maybe you've had bad advice and you start listening to the show and you start improving your score, then... <laughs> yeah, if the Princeton Review guys were your LSAT teacher, yeah. then, you know, like, sure, give us, give it a shot to, like, get some better advice, a new, you know don't give up on the LSAT because you've had bad LSAT advice, but just if you've been, I don't know if you've been working with us for a while and it's, you know, three months later, six months later, and you've been working on it diligently every day and the best you can get to is a 145. It, it's just, I don't, it doesn't seem like that's the right road. Yeah. Cool. I hope B has a, uh, you know, if B has a 160 something, then this 128 is just basically irrelevant. If they ask you about it, you can just say you were sick. Yep. That's it. There you go. Good All recap. Right. All right. So we're on pearls versus turds. We have one pearl in our history of this segment. We have 16 <laughs> ties or nine ties. No, that's the turds. No, 16, 16 turds. turds and then nine ties. Yeah. Um, okay. Idea from a listener. General gist is listed first, then his support. Okay. I would like to make the case that undergraduates who feel certain they will attend law school should aim to take the LSAT for the first time before the ju- their junior year. I believe there are many reasons for using this strategy, but to help guide discussion on the show, I would like to focus on four. Okay. This guy is going to be an attorney someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. It's like, you're admitted. <laughs> You already, you, (laughs) you, you made your, so look, look at how, yeah, that's really good. Right. I mean, start with your conclusion Mm -hmm. and then say immediately, like get right into the reasons. Yeah. And here we go. Okay. One for most majors, your classes will not significantly help you with the LSAT. While most classes teach basic LSAT skills like reading and critical thinking to some extent, I think it is rare for class material to directly reinforce what the LSAT tests on a consistent basis. Due to this, I don't think that waiting to take more major classes would significantly improve people's LSAT scores if observed on average. Okay. Um, All he's saying there is college isn't going to help you get better at the LSAT anyway. Yeah, I agree with this uh, premise, but I I don't know that that's a reason to take it early. I guess I'm not sure why that's a reason to take it early. Well, he's, I think he's, he's saying it's, it's just not a reason to wait. It's not a reason to wait. And this is your number one reason. Mm. Yeah. Not a great. (laughs) Yeah. That's not the best reason. Let's see what else. Okay. Two college. He or she, I don't know who this is. We don't have a name. We don't. Um, college classes generally get harder over time. Okay. I will concede that this point does have some exceptions. (laughs) I'm not sure that it matters. 
For students in majors such as biology and chemistry, their hardest classes may come earlier in their college careers. Okay. Still, many other majors courses get tougher from year to year. Waiting until later in your college career to begin prepping may lead to less available study time and increased stress from your classes. I would, I would add on to that, mm. um, that I think life just gets busier over time mm. generally. Mm-hmm. If you think that, you know, next year you're going to have more time to study for the LSAT, you're probably wrong. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you, you know, if you're a sophomore and you've got a relatively light semester or you've got a summer where you can't, you know, you don't know what you're going to do for the summer, you're going to just like dick around. Um, yeah, I, I can see how it makes sense to just like take advantage of available time and Maybe your courses are going to get tougher, but maybe your life's just going to get busier. Yeah. Yeah, as you get older, you tend to take on more responsibility, and as you take on more responsibility, you have less and less time. That's yep. the general rule. Um, okay, so I of the two points given so far, I feel like this one is stronger. If that's your likely case, I'm sure there are a lot of exceptions here. I wouldn't focus so much on how hard the classes are. I would focus more on how many classes you're taking, and how busy you expect your semester to be. Okay, three, taking early, taking early, taking the test early allows for multiple testing windows. Regardless of how we prepare, sometimes things happen. People get sick or violently ill, as Jake said, or B, no, B said that. People get sick or overstressed or just burned out from studying. Taking early allows the tester to take these challenges in stride and to adjust their potential testing window accordingly. This is contrasted with the usual model of testing in the spring or summer of your junior year, which leads to people feeling stressed to get their desired score in short and somewhat a short and somewhat rigid time frame. I think this is your your best point so far. I would I would say this should be your number one point. Take Taking it early. Yeah, and this is our advice yeah. all the time. Like if yeah. you're thinking about it and it's a realistic possibility, take it or, or start getting ready to take it. Okay. Um, four, taking early still allows for ample work experience. The average law school applicant is 24, meaning that they generally get one to two years of work experience before attending law school. Taking the LSAT in your sophomore year still allows for this since scores are good for five years after taking the test. So long as the test taker is confident they would like to begin attending law school within roughly three years of graduating, their score will still be valid for use on applications. Yeah, true. This is more like you won't get hurt by taking it early (laughs) argument. So I think the strongest point here is number three. Yep. Um, But, you know, there's because there is advice out there, like people say, like I heard Ann say it one time. And um, she even called me one time and said, like, did you really tell so-and-so to start prepping for the LSAT while they were a sophomore? Mm. And I was like, well, yeah, because they're sure they want to go to law school. Law schools only care about your highest score. And then all these reasons, you know, um, that this correspondent is making. But especially the third point about multiple testing windows. (laughs) It's like, yeah, do it. You know, don't not do it uh, if you're sure you want to go to Even law school. Even if you're not sure, um, the test might be a good, like, <laughs> bellwether for you, right? You take it and you're like, holy shit, like, I hate this. I suck at yeah, this. Right. It's like, okay, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe not. Maybe you need more time and ma- maturity and stuff like that. But if you realize it's not a path that you want to go down or you start getting into the LSAT and what's coming next because you're prepping for the test and it's a real thing now and you end up hating it, well, then you can refocus on something else before you leave school. You can say, wait a sec. Okay, actually, I'm thinking about going into something entirely different, maybe med school. And you still have time to sort of readjust, take the classes maybe that you need to take. I mean, I think I think these are some of the more like practical reasons why, yeah, you should uh, consider it at least if you're considering law school. 
Yeah. Not like one practice test and then give up. <laughs> Although if you take one practice test and give up, then yeah, that, <laughs> that's a pretty good sign in itself, yeah. right? Maybe you should go to business school. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Because lawyers work their asses off. And if you're not willing to work your ass off on the LSAT, then like, I just, you know, I don't think you're a lawyer. But if you if you prep for a while and you like really, really struggle, then yeah, that's a pretty good sign that this is maybe not the right field mm-hmm. for you. Um, I'm willing to give this one uh, a pearl vote. I think so. I think the, the core advice is take it early and there's nothing wrong with taking it late. People email us all the time, and they're like, well, I'm a non-traditional student because I'm 23. <laughs> they're like, you're, no, you're not non-traditional, but you're exactly, exactly average, average yeah. as this person has pointed out. The average law school applicant is 24. But in any case, they like, is it too late? And they're trying to fit it in before the cycle ends this year. It's like, no, if, if you're deciding in your life now to start prepping for the LSAT because you are serious about law school, you're not on anyone's timetable but your own. Just start getting ready for the test and take it when you need to take it. Um, and if that's earlier in your college career, as some people like to say, fine, great, good advice. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's maybe the yeah. The whole tip is just to like combat the kind of flawed. Don't take it until you're a junior or senior. Some people think like, oh, no, if you're going to take a gap year, then you should definitely wait for your LSAT prep. But you have to be, have the LSAT done before your gap year. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you probably should. If you're going to go to law school straight from college or if you're going to go even one year after college, um, yeah, you're going to have to do your LSAT prep while you're still in school. So. Might as well get started whenever you have available time. If that means when you're a freshman or a sophomore, so mm-hmm. be it. Okay. All right. Question two from Prep Test 71, which is the December 2013 LSAT. Section two. This is logical reasoning. Again, question two. Let's do it. An accountant says... The newspaper industry habitually cites the rising cost of newsprint to explain falling profits. But when corrected for inflation, the cost of newsprint is no more than it was 10 years ago. Far from being victims of high costs, newspapers have been benefiting from cheap newsprint for decades. The real threats to their profitability are falling circulation and falling advertising. Then the question says, the accountant's argument proceeds by, and we have five answer choices. What are you thinking on this type of a question? Well, right now, before you even read the question, I was thinking to myself, okay, what is this this person trying to convince me of? They're trying to convince me that the real threats to their profitability are falling circulation and falling advertising. Uh, They don't really provide any positive evidence for this they just provide negative evidence against the uh the cost argument but the 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 arguments against their rising costs seems decent to me i'm like okay if you adjust for fl- inflation the cost of newsprint newsprint is no more than it was 10 years ago and that's what they were citing so it doesn't seem like that's their problem uh, so I find the argument decent. There's no evidence for the final conclusion, so that's problematic. But the point here is that we start out with someone else's opinion, the newspaper industry's view, and then this person goes on and says why that's wrong and then starts to tell us another reason for that. Okay, so you got the topic sentence, and now you're going to eliminate the two worst answers. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Now, I'm going to go really fast because I got to do this for all the questions before I come back and actually answer this well, question. Because I have to go through five times, eliminate the two worst, then I go through it again and eliminate the next worst. <laughs> then I go through it again, and I lick my finger and hold it up in the air and see which way the wind's blowing. I'm not picking the right answer. I'm just picking the one that's... Less worse than the other. 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> by the way, we should we should talk oh, about boy. this phrase proceeds by. So this is a what I would call a reasoning question okay. or a method of reasoning question. They're basically asking yep. you, how did this person make their argument? And sometimes people like get caught up by this phrase, I guess, but it's just uh, how did they go about trying to support their conclusion? They may have failed, but what was their effort? And and when I look at this argument, I feel like, well, what they did is they told us some facts about inflation that show why someone else's argument is wrong. And then they offer an alternative explanation. So, yep. I think we could, you know, if I was going to start over from scratch on how to mm. teach the LSAT, <clears throat> I think I might just lump this in with must be true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just like, I, I think, I think maybe it would be easier for people to just start with a default presumption that the question is just a mm-hmm. must be true unless you spot one of the other types of yeah. questions. Because this is certainly in the family of must You're be true. You're saying like the top down. It's an evidence family. based. Top yeah. down question, mm-hmm. yes. And and it's just all they're asking you here is when they say the accountant's argument proceeds by, they're not asking you to capture the entire argument. You don't have to capture the main point. It's just which one did the accountant do? Like you you could you could put your finger on it, you could point to it, you could go like, mm-hmm. yep, right here. Mm-hmm. That's where they sure. did this thing. Like I'm picking that answer because that's what they did. <laughs> that's it. So it's like, I do say this in reading comp, you know, when in doubt, it's a must be true question. Yeah. Yeah. Like when in doubt, pick an answer that the passage yeah. said or as close to it sure. as you can find. And I think that could be useful on logical reasoning as well, because boy, must be true questions, main point questions, these, these reasoning questions or, or method or strategy of argumentation mm-hmm. questions, necessary assumption questions. Like agree, disagree questions. They're all just like, well, what did it say? Like what it's evidence based. All right. Cool. So did the accountant A reinterpret a popular analogy in order to use that analogy to support an alternative conclusion? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> People get mad at me when I do that in class sometimes. People are like, Nathan's too dismissive of the wrong answers. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's because the wrong answers are wrong. And like analogy, what? Where was there yeah. an analogy? Where was there a reinterpretation of an analogy? Yep. A popular analogy, yeah. no less. The only proper response to that is, huh? <laughs> the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, one thing to keep in mind is when you think about it as a must be true question, every single word has to match up with something in the passage. This has to be true. And uh, there's an an, there's a question. I don't know if I've mentioned this on the show, but there's a question in test. I think it's 30. No, maybe it's 39. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. 29. It's in test 29, I believe. Yeah. Anyways, in, in this question, um, the wrong one of the wrong answers is right in every single way except it says examples instead of example. Mm. And there was only one example oh, wow. in the passage. And people pick it all the time, and I'm like, examples? Eh? Did it say, ex- were there examples here? And people yeah. are like, well, well, no, but really? Really, the test is going to get me for that? I'm like, yeah, that's a fundamentally different thing. Were there people in the room or just one person? <laughs> Those are different things, right? And so... Here, when you have reinterpreting, you have popular, you have analogy, it's like any one of these things is going to kill this. So just pay attention and say, did that happen? Was that in the passage? It makes me think of Bill Clinton testifying, (laughs) (laughs) arguing about what the word is means. Oh my gosh, yeah. But it also makes me think about um, blue booking generally. Mm. I want to get a blue book and bring it to my LSAT class and pass it around and make people look at it. Yeah. Do you still, can you, can you tolerate this? If not, then just stop here. (laughs) (laughs) The blue book for people who don't know is this like, what do you think? 200 page, 300 page 
Like it's a total racket what it is, right? They update it every year, so you have to buy a new one. Yeah. And anyway, sorry. The the it's it's a style manual for how to basically how to cite your sources when you're writing a, a legal document, like a like a brief for the court. And <laughs> you would think that this style sheet could be ten pages. No, <laughs> the style manual is hundreds of pages and it's literally just like looking things up endlessly to determine if you're supposed to italicize this or if you're supposed to put quotation marks around that or this super fucking complicated system of abbreviations Yeah, where certain things have to be abbreviated and they have to be abbreviated the right way. Ugh. And it's You're how bringing to, back memories of law school. This dude, it sucks. It sucks so bad. It's like, well, I'm citing a legal opinion, but the opinion came, the opinion was, or, you know, I'm citing a, uh, a treatise, like an academic journal, but that journal was cited in this court opinion, and now I'm going to cite the court opinion, and now I have to look up all the rules for how to abbreviate and italicize and punctuate and all this shit. <laughs> the citation within the citation. Yeah. And like that's that's much more like what you're going to do as a lawyer than, you know, fucking Thurgood Marshall or whatever mm -hmm. you think a lawyer does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this example, Ben, of like one letter making an answer choice wrong. Yeah. If people are like, Really? I'm going to just like throw the blue book at them. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes. Yes, really. Yes. Page 143. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So A, reinterpreting a popular analogy, the accountant did not do that. B, using economic data to raise doubts about the current effectiveness of a historically accepted <laughs> approach. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. I mean, okay, so let's go through this part by part. Is there economic data? Yeah, the, I, I mean, at least not data maybe, but at least like a citation of, of inflation. Yeah, it and seems so, like a data point on some level. Yeah, I wouldn't like immediately dismiss it because of that. In fact, when I first Neither read that, I. I was like, oh, that could actually be the answer. Yeah, sure. So using economic data, yes, to raise doubts... Okay, yes. we are questioning something. Yeah. yeah. About the current effectiveness. Hmm. Current effectiveness of what? What is effective or ineffective? Their ability to raise profits? Were they ever saying that they're effective? Yeah. No. Like I don't remember. So this at this point, um I'm not it, happy. No, it's already conclusively wrong because no yeah. one ever cited the effectiveness of anything. Yeah. So we're not questioning the current effectiveness of anything. So that's out. But they then did it say goes, that profits were falling, and so people might think that that's an ineffective thing, but they never talked about it, its effectiveness. No. So this is out. Anyways, yeah. Well, and then it goes on to say, of a historically accepted approach. And we don't know whether it was or not. Who They're historically accepted anything? Like yeah. the newspaper industry has habitually cited this, but that's not a historically accepted approach. That's just their story. Yep. And it's no. <laughs> it's, it's no. Yeah. People, like when they get mad at me for being so dismissive of the wrong answers, it's like, well, but you have to understand, see, the correct answer is going to make sense <laughs> and the wrong answers don't. Like mm -hmm. it's not wrong because of some convoluted technical reason it's wrong because it doesn't fucking answer the question it's just like not it's just wrong <laughs> like it just it's like what is it even talking about i would say three quarters of the answers on the lsat that's my honest approach to them it's just like that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense <laughs> it's not the answer because it doesn't make sense like i'm not going to make sense of something that doesn't make sense it just doesn't make sense so then i'm on to the next C says, criticizing a newly developed method 
by demonstrating that a conventional method shows better results. Yeah, I, I'm already concerned by a newly developed method. Yeah, yeah. method of what? Method of making money? Yeah, a better mousetrap? That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. D, challenging an explanation that has been given for a phenomenon in order to introduce a different explanation. Okay, let's talk about this one. Challenging an explanation. Has an explanation been given? Yes, the newspaper industry explains their falling profits. They use the word explain too. Not that they had to, but they did. (laughs) (laughs) That has been given for a phenomenon. Now, phenomenon is a LSAT word. Comes up a lot on the LSAT. We don't usually use it in life, but it means an event or something that's happened. I always tell people to just put thing. If you see the word phenomenon, just put thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Same thing with principle. Put thing. <laughs> well, I like to replace principle with rule, but I'm happy to put in thing too. If you yeah. Want. Challenging an explanation that has been given for a thing, a phenomenon. Yes. What thing? The falling profits. Yep. In order to introduce a different explanation. They did that at the very end. That's actually how we describe this argument. So I would keep this open with a smile. Yeah, it's going to be the answer. E says, calling into question a justification for a practice. I wouldn't even read the rest of that. A justification for a practice? No, a justification. Falling profits is not a a practice. No. (laughs) It's an event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If it was a justification for a phenomenon, Mm. I would keep reading it. But calling into question a justification for a practice would be like, oh, well, the reason why I do this thing is because of this reason. Yep. That's what a practice would be. It's like a thing that you are doing. but Not a thing that's happening. No. Losing money is not a practice. Um, It goes on. (laughs) It's probably going to be wrong again. Um, Calling into question a justification for a practice by showing how the same justification can be used to support a clearly undesirable practice. What? I don't even know where that's going. Yeah, it's like, well, I do that because it feels good. Yeah, okay, but if you were going to use that justification, you could do all sorts of bad things. That would be E, but that's not what the argument did, so the answer is D. Yeah. It really makes sense, guys. Like, contrary to what Malcolm Gladwell believes about the LSAT, the LSAT makes perfect sense. And if you just read it more carefully, you're going to see that there's meaning there. The questions make perfect sense. The wrong answers don't make sense, <laughs> but the right answers do. Yeah. And um, that's the most important thing I think that I can ever teach about the LSAT. For these particular questions uh, that describe in abstract, somewhat abstract terms, what is concretely happening in the passage, what you can do is just break them down part by part as we did. So it's like you don't have to read the entire answer. Just start with the first three words using economic data. Stop. Did they do that? Yes. Okay. Continue. Did they not do that? No. Okay. Then you're done. That answer is wrong because it's got to do it the entire time. Yeah. You have to work. Mm-hmm. That's right. You have to read every word of the answer you pick, but you don't have to read every word of the wrong answers. As soon yep. as an answer is wrong, it's presumed wrong and you move on. Yep. Uh, and then the, the one you do pick, you have to read not only every word, but every single letter, Ben, as you pointed out. Mm-hmm. And make sure that you can vouch for it. You know, Would you stand up in court and say, yes, your honor, this accountant has challenged an explanation that has been given for a phenomenon in order to introduce a different explanation. Yeah, like that stands yeah. up, right? Yep. The judge could start asking you questions. Counselor, what phenomenon are you referring to? Yep. Oh, um, the falling profits. Yep. And there was an explanation given? Um, yeah, uh huh. Um, the rising cost of newsprint. And they challenged yep. that explanation? Yes, they did by pointing out that inflation, if they correct for inflation, it's actually not a rising cost. Oh, and what's the new explanation, counselor? Well, it's the falling circulation and falling advertising. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's all right there. It just, it makes perfect sense. And all the four wrong answers just go off the rails. Yeah. All right. No, it's a very good test because every, basically what you did is you took all the words in that answer choice and you turned them into questions. You said, does that happen? Does that happen? Does that happen? Does that happen? And the answer is clearly yes every time. You, you can find it. When people get overwhelmed by these answer choices because of, the abstract words all put together in one <laughs> phrase or claim. Just 
start breaking it down. Just deal with one part at a time and say, okay, well, did that thing happen? And if it did, then keep going. Cool. This, this question is like objectively valid, you know, like the wrong answers aren't just not as good. Mm -hmm. The wrong answers aren't worse. They are conclusively wrong. They misstate what the accountant did. Yeah. And the right answer is not just best. The right answer is valid. The right answer is exactly what the accountant did. You can vouch for every word in the correct answer here. Yeah. Um, I should yeah. clarify just based on some things that we talked about earlier. There are some questions in which the one or two or sometimes even more, but rarely, but one or two of the wrong answers are worse. But that is going to depend on the question type. Like if it says, which one of the following most strengthens, it's possible to have an answer choice that's worse. But in most of those cases, those answers are just wrong too. <laughs> They're just the ooh. vast majority of cases. Yeah. It's not close. It's not, it's, it's, it's far rarer than students think that there's yeah. actually a second best. Yeah. You just shouldn't be narrowing it down to two answers very often. You should be hating four answers almost always because the wrong answers are just conclusively wrong. I mean, I get it, the question all the time. People are like, yeah, Nathan, but if B wasn't there, then D would be, would be a fine answer, right? And I read it and I'm like, no, nope. See that word right there? That means that this answer is 100% wrong. I don't care how much you like the other words in this answer choice. That word right there makes it conclusively wrong. Yeah. It's not second best. It's 100% the worst. <laughs> it's just out. It's wrong. There we go. There we go. You guys can uh, join the Thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook. There's some 1,400 members there talking about all sorts of LSAT funness. Uh, You can follow us on Instagram at Thinking LSAT. You can also tweet us at Thinking LSAT at NFOX or at Olson Benjamin. Uh, My classes in the D.C. area can be found at strategyprep.com. Nathan's classes can be found on foxlsat.com. He's in San Francisco and Los Angeles. We also have online one-on-one tutoring options as uh, well as our own online class, which is coming out eventually. We also have lsatdemon.com. That's our joint project that is the best LSAT AI tutor out there. You just create an account. You can start for free for a week, start doing practice problems. It will learn about what you're good and bad at and start giving you more practice problems at your skill level. You can listen to us in all sorts of ways as we talked about earlier. That was show 199. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.